Oh, sweet Auburn, you are an historic district with a rich legacy worth preserving. How do we honor your history as we imagine your future? I'm Dr. Ralph about Sui Watkins. Let's talk it out. The art of deep, rich conversations is a lost art in our present culture. On Talk It Out, we talk about real issues that affect real people that will make a real difference in your life. We reclaim and restore the art of meaningful conversations. We think together, grow together, and are transformed by the connections we make. What we start, you actually finish. So join us as we talk it out. Again, I'm Dr. Ralph Basui Watkins, and today we're talking about the historic Sweet Auburn District. We will discuss how its history gets preserved while revitalization efforts are underway to ensure its future. And I've got the perfect guest here for this conversation. I'm happy to welcome Jean Kansas, cultural developer, and Reese International, curator of the Madam C.J. Walker Museum and Word Studio. Welcome, my brothers, to Talk It Out. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Walker, you, for having Thank us. you all for being I'm happy to be here with you. So, Reese, let's start with you. Okay. Talk to us about um, uh, the Madam C.J. Walker Museum and, and the Word Studio. What, what's that about? What is that? Uh, let's just start at the beginning of how I discovered the space. Mm -hmm. I'm a hairstylist, salon on North Avenue, North Highland. I'm driving on Auburn Avenue about 30 years ago, make a right turn. I look to my left and I see Madam C.J. Walker on the glass, slam on my brakes, get out of the car, go to the window, and start paying homage because I know the legacy of Madam C.J. Walker. Which is what? She is one of the first African-American females in North America to become a millionaire in the beauty industry. This apparently was one of her locations. So I paid homage to this space for over 30 years, never interested in the space. 18 years ago, I needed a new location for my salon. So I thought about this. I come back, get the lease from the Masons who own the property, go inside, and beauty tools were scattered about from the late 1900s that were left there by the Walker agents that used to work in that shop. Wow. So immediately I knew not just to run a salon, but to start preserving some of that history because preservation was not in my wheelhouse. I was just a hairstylist and, and, and doing my thing. And the studio was in the same space? Two years into my lease, a black woman comes to the door, just sticks her head in as I'm doing hair and says, Mr. Reesey, did you realize WERD studio? The first black radio station in North America, the one that Dr. King used, was actually upstairs over this space. Wow. I said, no, ma'am, I did not know that. I'm going to come back, because I want to talk about this issue, that how preservation was not in your wheelhouse, but now it is in your wheelhouse, and what that Very means. much so. So, Gene, talk about being a cultural developer. Love the term. Absolutely. Well, I can relate somewhat to what Reese was saying about having it within me as a preservationist. Um, and, and by extension cultural developer, but not knowing it yet. Being from New Orleans, um, Katrina happened. And when you see your home destroyed and you quickly realize it's about much more than just the buildings, but the relationships, the people, the conversations, the history and culture surrounding it, you figure out what's really important to preserve. And preservation's about conservation, protection and care. And, and I thought about that in living in Atlanta. I've been here for about on a 15 years at that time. And I said, I need to do something. I am a preservationist. And so like, I can understand where you're coming from, Reese, and, and appreciate the, the thought behind this episode. Yeah, I mean, myself, being the pastor of Wheatree Baptist Church, you know, um, was dropped in my lap with this great historic resource, right? So while I'm trying to walk in this kind of tense space, right, one trying to make it a church of the future, while also paying homage and remembering its past. So I find we, we both have kind of, been, all three of us have been put in this kind of space, Absolutely. right? With this great responsibility and while also trying to thrive at the same time. So Reese, give me a sense of how you walk in that tension, right? On the one hand, preserving a space, but while on the one hand, you're having this, this live shop that actually still, people still gonna get their hair done. That's fascinating that you would ask that because early in the development of creating this Madam C.J. Walker, now Madam C.J. Walker Museum, because it, all I did was add museum under the original copy. And I realized in order for me to respect the past and create a sense of integrity of the space, as well as the tools that were left, I made a conscious effort not to run a full 
on salon, that I would back away from the salon, make less money, use a lot of the space for the integrity of the museum and only hire maybe one or two key people as opposed to when you go to a salon, right, right, right. space is a premium. You want as right. many stylists as you can fit. But out of respect of the history, I chose to just make less money and push the historical narrative forward. Let's talk about you, Gene, because you've had that same dynamic, right? But I want to talk about Reese. I want to talk about you. Because right. I, I remember when, they, when you were uh, beginning to purchase the Lamb Daily World building yes. and a lot of conversation around that, you know, but you were very conscious about trying to say, how do we remember, right, while moving forward? Talk about how, how you have successfully managed that particular tension in that context on Auburn Avenue. Sure. I mean, there's the, the obvious uh, being a white developer in an incredibly significant historic community on an international level, mm -hmm. African American history. Yep. I knew that being successful was vitally important, and so I made the top priority being successful, but I thought about that on a spectrum. Um, that means being inclusive, being welcoming, being open being transparent, being forthright. And because I believed, and fortunately it's, it's proven to be true, that if we all win, we all win. Right. And so um, both of you are examples. You came by one day and yeah. wanted a tour, I said, let's go. Yeah. A lot of developers, I think, mistakenly so, are too protective. Fear uh, can immobilize or have someone run. And I think fear is a major issue. And, and I tell my son, don't be afraid, be careful. Right. But you know, be welcoming and be willing to take some risk. I think what Reese has done is created a welcome center for yeah. Auburn. Yeah. Um, I think that um, that's vitally important. And I hope that through our work, we can emulate some of what Reese has done and, mm -hmm. and do historic preservation along the way. I think I think your space is welcome as well. I mean, Condessa Coffee is a welcoming space. You know that Atlanta Little World that sign still sits mm -hmm. very prominently, right? So, I think you successfully navigated that space of how do we make this space a living space, right, while also being this memorial. And that's kind of what we're all we're all wrestling yeah, with, right? Even in my context, tightrope. right? I got to balance this, this historic church while it has its historical significance, honor that, never forget that, while also creating it the church of today. It's going to look quite different. So we're in this kind of interesting intersection, right? But I like what you say, being, being respectful, being mindful, not being fearful, taking chances, and really being conscious of what we've been given. Yes. And, be, and be real. So yeah. like the, you yeah. know, Word Studios, Madam C.J. Walker's yeah. great example. Yeah. Weed Street's yeah. a great example. The Daily World historically started, it was built in 1912. It wasn't the Daily World at that time. That's right. It actually... Um, in 1918 was a coffee company mm -hmm. called the Virgil Coffee Company. So coffee is, is true to its roots. In that same space in the 40s, and, and Reese knows this, it was called Ponciana Club. And it was a, a great joint where Benny Goodman played, wow. Louis Armstrong, Billy Holiday made appearances. And so this place of community, of gathering, of conversation, of culture. And so um, I, I think that Condessa is a great fit for that. Yeah, and I, I think that what, I, what I've always appreciated about you when I first met you, you were wide open to an a conversation on film, um, and you know the history. You know and respect the history. And that's important, right? As a developer, you don't have to do that research, but you know and respect the history. And you can tell the story of the building, and you're continuing the story. So, Reese, let's talk about this. So, you, this, this issue of preservation was not in your wheelhouse. Not at all. Now you have this in your lap. How have you embraced this role of, of being a person who's into preservation? How have you embraced the role of being a storyteller and being kind of an archivist of this great story on Auburn Avenue? I really do not know how I embraced it. I just am an open human to things that I felt were obvious to me. I discovered the space, I move into the space. The space told me what to do. And the space is beautiful though. I mean, Reese, that well, space is yeah, amazing. That, that goes to my... It's an amazing space. My artistic, I mean, as a tw as a 11 and 12 year old, I realized that artistically I had something going on I just didn't understand, so I've been studying long before people start studying designers. When I was 11 or 12, I was studying Cristobal Balenciaga and all the early designers. So I thought at 13, I was gonna be a designer in Paris. And so I went to design school. So everything you see in the salon is a culmination of my artistic, natural artistic talents and what I've learned along the way, as well as travel. 
because when you travel, you absorb so much culturally and your perspective changes. So when people come into my spot, either from the U.S. or from abroad, people from abroad says, this feels like Europe. Yeah, it does. It and does, people man. here it just is. come in, there's a three steps you make, yeah. and you just stop, and it happens every single time. Two to three steps, and people just stop and just look around because it's sensory overload. It really is. But you, but you, you have this kind of interplay with the albums and the, the other things you develop up top and the things come off the wall and the, the mirrors and then these artifacts. Yeah, there. the historical artifacts All that's blended. there in that yeah. space, right? And it is a sensory overwhelming space, right? But you, but you, let's talk about schooling, Gene. So when we meet, you're at Georgia Tech doing what? I was studying digital media. Talk about that. So my background educationally is, is in entrepreneurship, it's an undergraduate degree. I went to pursue a master's in digital media because apropos of today, storytelling is important. It creates value. Um, value motivates people. When people are motivated, they take action, results, and change. Mm -hmm. And the way that we are sharing stories through media now is in a digital manner for the mm -hmm. most part. And so I thought, well, this would be good. Um, what I didn't really anticipate was what I really learned would be a structure, a way to think, a way to research, a way to present. Mm -hmm. And so I came out of Georgia Tech with a lot more knowledge about that than digital media, yeah. per se. Mm -hmm. um, although, I mean, I know a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you know. It seemed like it triggered something yeah, different yeah. inside yeah, of yeah. you. Yeah. But I would, I, I, I would think, I think, you know, the educational process is just that, right? I mean, you get a degree in something, but it's done so much what happened, you, how you receive, how it begins to transform you. So, so Risa, tell me about, about the storytelling, the storytelling entity and what it means to be a storyteller on Auburn Avenue, right? And how do we preserve a story? Here's the question I want you to really wrestle with, I'm wrestling with. How do you preserve a story while simultaneously creating new stories? How do you connect those stories? And what's our responsibility to connect those stories, if any? Well, for me, specifically, if you're dealing with the legacy of Madam C.J. Walker, as a stylist, I was taught in beauty school, she was the first to become a millionaire in the beauty industry, and if you Google it, inventor of the pressing comb, curling iron hair relaxer. It's a wonderful story, it's just not accurate. Madam uh. C.J. Walker was one of many African-American beauty pioneers. The actual beginning of the hair, black hair care industry starts with Annie Turnbull Malone. Madam C.J. Walker was her student. Miss Malone was worth 10 million U.S. dollars in 1910 while Madam Walker was in her beauty school. So for me, that whole storytelling aspect is crucial to get people to understand the totality as opposed to the sound bite that North America will feed you because we're in a sound bite culture, yeah. you know, but the story is much broader. It, it so I use my venue yeah. to expand yeah. on the the total picture and not just yeah. the isolated incident. And that's what I wrestle with. How, how do we continue to tell these interesting stories? How do we tell the story of Auburn Avenue from Cortland to Boulevard? Such a rich history, um, a living history. Now, this conversation is awesome, but we have to take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Our guests today are Gene Kansas and Reese International. And we're talking about uh, one of my favorite places in Atlanta, uh, Sweet Auburn. So, so, Gene, as we think about this space, one thing I'm wrestling with is, you know, we have this dynamic of this commercialization of this kind of historic space. Can you talk about some of that tension and how we, how we resolve that? Sure. I mean, it's important to uh, remember our past. And I think in the case of Atlanta, it really is our future. I mean, if you think about it, Sweet Auburn, there is only one birthplace of the civil rights movement in the world. So... Yes, that's important to protect. At the same time, we're living in 2018. It's important to be current and modern. And so there is a careful, I, I think, balance maybe, yeah. tension that's uh, important to be aware about, to be smart about, to have processes in place to take care of. Yeah, and I think, I think Mother Teresa said something. I may be paraphrasing her, you know, no money, no mission, right? So you have to find somebody to have an economic generator. Absolutely. But when I first came down Auburn Avenue, it was like a, a ghost town. Now I see it's being revived and life's coming back to that space. So we have this, this interesting tension there. So, Risa, you think about this as the space comes back to life, and you've been a part of that, right? You were there when the streetcar was being built, et cetera. Um, what do you want visitors to know about this space? What do you want residents to think and know about this space? What I would like them to know is what the elders now tell me when they were kids 
I get all the stories because the barbershop is next door to me. So a lot of the individuals that go to the barbershop that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, they'll stop in my space and share their story. There's one guy who, when he gets his hair cut, he walks past my studio, goes to the corner, and just stands there. And then he comes back to my shop. And so I start asking him, you know, why do you go to the corner? It rem he can see himself as a kid standing at the library that used to be on the corner. And he tells me he remembers when Dr. King and Abernathy and the hustlers, the pimps, the prostitutes, the drug boys, the scam artists, the musicians, all used to come up Auburn Avenue dressed to kill. Wow. It was a wow. proper, you prepared yourself yeah, yeah. for going to Auburn. You just didn't show up. And you think it was, it was that interest, intersection, even in those days, of the sacred and the secular, right? Yes. You had, on the one hand, these great houses of worship in the midst of this major economic engine, right? As they said, the richest Negro street in the world at mm -hmm. one point in its time. So, Gene, talk about how you've embraced that history. I mean, talk about what you're doing with Constellations and what you've done with, with, with Atlanta and the other Talk about how, you, how you've lived in that space, embraced it, and then moving us forward. Sure. Well, I know that I'm preaching to the pastor on this. <laughs> it's important to be in a position of leadership and allow others to do their work, um, to support them, to support their goals, their missions, and their dreams. And so Constellations is a civic, socially-based shared workspace that aims to do just that. And where is it at? It's at 135 Auburn, same building as Apex, it's, uh, a 1910 Neil Reed building. Um, built as the Southern School Book Depository. And if you look at the top of the building, you'll see an open book and torch of knowledge. And that's really the ethos of constellations. Interestingly, um, I think for the first time, at least since I've been here, which has been 23 years, about a week and a half ago when we opened officially, 15 businesses that are new to Auburn moved on to the street. That's pretty important. And that's not me being someone that's like doing it. All, all I'm doing and what I see my role and the role of Constellations is to be a platform for that. Not any one person can do it alone. It, there has to be sharing, there has to be coming together. And so Constellations, is, you know, as you imagine conceptually, is this idea of stars coming together, creating a picture. The picture tells a story and the story we're trying to tell is about the bigger picture. I love that. So, so talk about this recently in terms of what, what, what was Eugene doing, what we're doing at Wheat Street, and what you're doing at um, the Madison Walker Museum and Word Studio. How do you see this um, from Cortland and Boulevard? What do you see the future of this space being? This, this sweet art, we you know now we're sitting in the middle of this national park, right? I think the largest yeah. urban national park I'm in the country. You're in the middle of that. We're, our church is in the middle of that as well. So if you said 10 years from now, you know, let's take your crystal ball, what do you see Cortland Boulevard, Auburn Avenue becoming. And I take my cue from the young people that come in as WBRD Studio Madam C.J. Walker seems to be, as you mentioned earlier, a, a venue for young people to come and share ideas. They either use my space or rent my space out. And from listening to them, they can feel this renaissance, which to me is a reflection of the original renaissance that took place between, yeah. what, 1910 and 1930. Yeah. So this is a resurgence of that. And the difference is people other than brown people are inclusive because Caucasians came to Auburn for the entertainment. They didn't really own any real estate or anything down there, but they came for the entertainment value. Now we have this new renaissance where a variety of ages, a variety of races are now interested in being a part of this new renaissance. And, 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 yeah, interesting, right? Because that, like you, as you said, Gene, we're actually honoring the history of being a part of the Renaissance. Go ahead, you're gonna say something. Well, just that I think both of you all do so well is providing this opportunity for people to come down and experience, to live richly, to learn. And so Georgia Tech, I know from being there, from visiting with Reese, these are students for the most part, and I love Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. but like it's a very heads down place. And there are a lot of kids who spend four or five years in Atlanta, don't even know where they are. Mm -hmm. When they come to Auburn Avenue, when they go to Madam C.J. Walker Museum, their eyes are opened, not just to what Reese is doing, but to the world. And then by doing so, they have more of an idea of who they are, and the city has a better idea of who we are. 
Yeah. And I think with us you know, at the church, we're developing the Norbert G. Harris Museum and Wheat Street History Center. We're, we're starting Wheat Street tours, starting Wheat Street productions to tell these stories. And I think even students coming down and being in that context to hear those stories will be transformative. And you're well, demonstrating what's possible. Yeah. Like, the work that you all are doing is beautiful, mm -hmm. and it's showing folks that you can preserve the history and have it new and re revitalized, mm -hmm. and it still be strong, in fact, stronger. Yeah, yeah, and, and, I, I, and I think it's because of that respect for the history, but also realizing through this renaissance, this kind of revival, it, we're really honoring the history, right? Absolutely. That, 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 well, some would say, well, this urban renewal means Negro removal or gentrification is going on. I know when I first came down to the avenue, it was like it was a, you know, you had the King Center and a few other spots, but yeah. it was really a dying spot. Now it's a much more lively spot, and you're part of what's going on in Edgewood, and then the kind of downtown district, a lot's happening there. And I think if we can embrace, live in the tension, um, it's there. So, Gene, but if, can, may I say something sure, about sure, that? Sure, 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 sure. The future of our history is not a foregone conclusion. You don't have to look far in the district to see places in peril. And some of that is just because it's sitting there being neglected. Some of it is because of developers behaving badly. Some of it's because of mother nature, like the tornado that hit the daily world, as an example. If we're not being active in preserving that, it's gonna be gone and we're gonna have a Disneyland. And like Disneyland's great, but this is the birthplace of the civil rights movement. And, and, and I, I think I thank you for saying that, Gene, because that, that's that's so important to us, right? You know, being in this national park now, how do we ensure we preserve these buildings, we tell these stories, while simultaneously building a future story by intentionally writing the story, you know, and make sure the story is inclusive, right? Because we were talking earlier about, and you know, one thing I, I know that it's on my agenda to write, you know, the history of Auburn Avenue. You have that great book by Gary Pomerant where Peachtree meets Sweet Auburn, mm -hmm. but there's not the book on Sweet Auburn, right? Mm -hmm. And the story that could be told, and if we do that in context while simultaneously being part of the revival and renaissance, I think we're honoring, right, the forefathers and foremothers. And also, as you said, Reese, this issue of inclusivity, right? Because I've always wrestled with who owns these stories, right? Who are our new partners in storytelling? Yeah. You know, we, we all are there, right? You know what I mean, right? So give me a sense of that. Give me, help me with that, Gene, because that's something I get a lot of. Well, we, this is our space. What does that mean? Whose space is this? So, one, um, on the King Day, I was at the King Center, and it, there was a group of international students there. And there was a young woman, and her eyes were filled with tears. Mm. And she looked at me and she goes, our history, speaking about China, is so old. Yours is so new, relatively speaking. But yours is so much more rich yeah, yeah. it's it's the world's yeah. now it yeah. is the the genesis of it of course is african-american we all care about that pay respect to that have to honor that help to to do what we can to um, share that with the world I think that was I mean you're a pastor was yeah, that yeah. the the message yeah I mean I, 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 I think the thing is if we get this story to the world in, like in our context William Holmes' border story. I mean, he was one of the fathers of the movement in Atlanta, one of the most undertold stories in Atlanta. Absolutely. And I think when you tell these stories, I'm amazed when students come to my class and I lecture in this context, they ha they're they re-energized. Yeah. I had a student recently, I was talking about Dr. Borders. I brought my class down Auburn Avenue. I was lecturing in the church. The student starts to cry, um, a white male. And he, he was convicted about his own call to justice because he was in a context here in an old story, a 1950s story about how Buses were integrated in Atlanta under Dr. Board's leadership. This young man then says he's recommitted to justice, right? And I'm like, wow. What if I had not invited him in, right? What if I had not told the story? What if I had not preserved the space? What if I had not come to the space? All of that was significant to him. So I think you're right. It, it's, it's, it's an, it, it has an African-American genesis, um, and persons who birthed the story have rights to tell and share the story, but it's a story we share with the world to transform the world to be a more just place. Yeah. I happened to see the documentary Maynard this past yeah, weekend, yeah, yeah. Um, produced by Auburn Avenue Films. Amazing. Yeah. I was not anticipating the emotional response yeah. I had to it. it is, it's a very emotional film. I haven't seen that one yet. It's amazing. And, and I left there having a new and more profound um, feeling about Atlanta and my own existence, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's a great example in more popular culture of sharing the story. But I think you're right though, you think about that. 
uh, I sometimes think, like, I, I think I know so much. I'm a professor. I have five earned degrees, three <laughs> term degrees. But you always see the story and say, wow, I didn't know. Because Maynard, of course, came before me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I know, but it's interesting, right? So we continue to tell those stories, how that story had a profound effect upon you. As we demonstrated, my student had a profound effect upon him. And part of what we're doing is keeping the story alive. We're actually keeping the story, by keeping the space and place alive. And that's so what energizes me, yeah. is, yeah. Um, is I'm learning more about Auburn because of what I'm doing from people that are from Auburn. Yeah. And one example is a gentleman just brings and, a- And now you're from Auburn too. That's one, one thing I want to lose, right? But <laughs> while we talk about this like this, like yesterday thing, we are there, we are Auburn, right? Yes, yes. You know what I mean? So we represent- Even though I'm not born here, right, right. I, it's but, but, still but, but, a part but, but of me But we now. all, on a daily basis, we're in yes. that space, right? I mean, I drive my little Kia Soul there every day, right? Um, so we are Auburn, yeah. and we got on that. Oh my gosh, out of time, you're joking me. Ow! Oh! This has been good. It's always good to talk with friends, people that I respect and love, and we're doing this work together. We're gonna have to pause right here. I wanna thank my guest, Jean Kansas, cultural developer, and Reese International, curator of the Madam C.J. Walker Museum and Word Studio. Up next, my final thoughts. So here's what I think. I think we're living in the midst of a renaissance, a revival of Auburn Avenue. And I am excited. Because in the midst of this renaissance and revival, we're actually honoring the history of this great street. It was the epicenter of African-American history, the intersection of the sacred and the secular. It was a heartbeat of the city. And that's what it's becoming again. And what I love about those who are there now, we refuse to forget. We're going to remember. We're gonna tell that old, old story while simultaneously writing the next chapter. We're not writing a new book, we're simply writing the next chapter. The story of Auburn Avenue continues, and we're gonna live in that tension between yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We're gonna hold these sacred stories close to our hearts while writing the next chapter. So if you're in Atlanta, come down to Auburn Avenue. Visit the Madam C.J. Walker Museum Visit the Apex Museum, visit Constellation, visit the King Center, visit the great houses of worship on that street. We're waiting on you. Well, that's what I think. I want to know what do you think. Write to me at programming at AIBTV.com and follow me on Twitter at Ralph Basui. And remember, you may very well change the world if you'll just talk it. I'm Dr. Ralph Basui Watkins. I'll talk to you real soon. <laughs>